Well, a very warm welcome on what is a yet another cold Colorado Sunday morning. So thankful you are here, truly, genuinely. Glad you got in safely on the ice. How many of you guys were out shoveling yesterday? Doing shoveling yesterday. How many of you went next door and shoveled your neighbor's driveway? Live missionally, do the right thing. That's awesome. Hey, uh, I love what it is that God is doing here. Uh, if you are relatively new to Mountain Springs, we have seen a, a real surge of new people coming to Mountain Springs now since uh, really the middle of November. And because of that, we did a couple of first step events, but we have added another event. For those who are new here and for the first time, we are adding this new hybrid event. And so what it is, is we have two events, and it's first step, next step, and we're going to do a hybrid event where we're going to do both of them on one night. And so coming up on February uh, Tuesday uh, the 27th, February Tuesday the 27th, if you'd love to join us, we'd love to have you for a meal and answer any questions about mission, vision, values, ministry, pathway, philosophy, etc. Get your questions answered that evening. Join our team in the lobby as we set it up with round tables and we just really immerse ourselves in the reality of community together. If you've yet to go to first step or even next step, come for an evening where we'll do both on the same evening. But for today, what we're doing is we're continuing on in our series, He Gave. It's a series where we're looking at the transformative power of generosity and the transformation that occurs in our lives when we recognize that we are owned by God and we ought to give back to God what it is that He wants from our lives. And when you look at Scripture, really as a framing of our message this weekend, as you look at Scripture, there are 1,000 references about prayer and faith in all of the canon of God's Word. And yet there are double that, twice as many references about possessions and ownership and God wanting the best and the first of our lives. And so as we go through this series, what we're doing is we're really looking at the Scripture. We're looking at the promise. We're looking at the invitation and the instruction to live the generous Life And so what I want to do is I want to pray today as we kind of set up our message today. It's going to be a, a look at some scripture. Then we're going to look at some principles pertaining to the first and best of our lives. And then I'm also joined this weekend by two tables that are going to support a crazy, distracting, yet very, very fun and vivid, I pray, illustration to show God's table and our table. God's table, the invitation to give to God first. And our table, what it is that we have remaining when we give to God first. So we're going to talk about that partway through the message. I'm going to be joined by some folks up here and they're going to come and they're going to kind of prepare these tables for us and show us what it looks like when we give first to God. But let's pray and then we'll dig into the Word of God. We'll be in some scripture here today as we really ask God to speak into our lives. Lord, right now we, uh, we pause and reposition our lives to really make you preeminent, make you first, make you primary. Right now, whatever it is that we have going on, whatever it is that we have going on later today, whatever it is that we had going on here, the argument we had with our spouse on the way to church today, the conversation that we had with our kids that we want to see restored and redeemed, God, I pray in all of that right now, we just give it to you. We give it to you. God, we're entrusting that to you right now, that you would do a transformative work in and through our lives. And we ask this in your name. Everyone said, amen and amen. All right, if you have a Bible with you, paper or digital, go ahead and turn or scroll with me to 1 Corinthians chapter 6 and Exodus chapter 13. 1 Corinthians chapter 6 and then Exodus 13. So the second book in the Old Testament and then also the letter there to the believers in Corinth that was written around... 53 to 57 or so AD that was written to the believers by Paul. We'll begin with the uh, one in 1 Corinthians 6. And what it is, is this verse is really the exclamation point that is the introductory verse that will be the verse that will sustain us throughout the entire theme of the message this weekend. Let me read it to you. You are not your own. Speaking to believers, speaking to Christian people who love God, who don't just believe in God, but they're a follower of God. You are not your own. For you were bought with a price, so glorify God in your body. Very basic, 101, if you will, to faith, and that is this. If you have surrendered your life to Jesus, what God wants in return is the surrendered life. He wants you to bring and lay down your life upon the altar of sacrifice and not go back or crawl off, but leave it there and give your life to God. And it's that God wants to restore your life. Now, you probably heard a pastor or a preacher say this at some point in your life. God wants to restore the worst of your life. Amen to that. He wants to restore unto you the years that the locusts have eaten. Yes, amen to that. He wants to redeem the broken, shadowy parts of your life. Amen. He wants to restore it. But yet, in addition to that, 
God doesn't just want the worst of your life. He wants the first and best of your life. To where he restores the worst, but he wants to crown and redeem the best. God wants all of your life. God wants all of your life. So much so that Paul writes to the church there, to the believers, you were bought with a price and then conversely, you are to glorify God in your body. So what I want to do is I want to walk you through some of the principles of the first and the best and bringing the very first and best of our lives to God. So with that, we pivot into Exodus 13, the second book in the Old Testament. And what it is, is the principle of ownership is on display. It says in verse 2, consecrate, consecrate, that means to set apart, meaning to lay this apart for God, consecrate to me all of the firstborn, whatever is the first to open the womb among the people of Israel, both of man and of beast, is <clears throat> mine. So here's the context. In the hours prior to God's people procuring the promises of the land, of the provision that he had for them, in the hours leading up to that moment, he told them, he told his people through Moses to curate a culture of trust, to curate a culture of trust through demonstrating that he was first in their lives and that as he demonstrated his provision to them and they in return demonstrated their dependence upon God for his power and presence. He says, consecrate, set apart the first and best to me. Skip down to verse 11. Now, when the Lord brings us into the land and he gives it to us, verse 11 of Exodus 13, we shall set apart to God all that first opens the womb. All the firstborn of our animals that are males are the Lord's. The principle that we're looking at this weekend is simply this, that God doesn't want your last and your leftovers. He wants your first and your best. He doesn't want what was reheated from Wednesday in your Tupperware dish and you put it in the microwave for two minutes and say, God, this is the best I got. He's like, no, it's not the best you got. And I want the first and the best of your life, not the last and the leftovers of your life. Exodus 23, verse 19. The best of the first fruits of your ground you shall bring into the house of the Lord your God, and then Proverbs 3, 9. Let me read it to you. No need to turn there. Honor the Lord with your wealth and with the best part of everything you produce. You might be thinking right now, man, uh, God just is happy with whatever it is that I bring to him. If I bring some sort of sacrifice of praise or if I bring some sort of gift of worship, whatever it is that I bring, he's just so happy that I'm present and so happy that I'm here. And I'd say, Scripture wouldn't support that. Scripture would say that God wants the very first and best of our lives. And I want to illustrate that through the Scripture. So now turn one book earlier. There is only one book earlier than Exodus, and it's Genesis. And so Genesis chapter 4, verses 1 and 2 initially. And then we'll look at verses 3 through 5 for the principle. Now, here's the context. Adam knew Eve, his wife, and she conceived and bore Cain, saying, I have gotten, quote, a man with the help of the Lord... And again, she bore his brother Abel. Now, verse 3. Now, Abel was a keeper of sheep and Cain a worker of the ground. In the course of time, Cain brought to the Lord an offering of the fruit of the ground. And Abel also brought to the Lord. And the Lord had regard for Abel and his offering. Verse 5. But for Cain and his offering, he had no regard. So Cain was very angry and his face fell. And the Lord said to Cain, why are you so upset? Why is... Why is your face fallen? If you do well, will you not be accepted? And if you do not do well, sin is crouching at your door. And it's desire. Now, this is true for all of us. Sin and sinful desires are contrary to God's best for you. And you must rule over it or over them. So what is the context? The context is this. Two boys, two brothers, two sons, both bring an offering to the Lord. One brings an offering over the, quote, course of time, meaning when it was convenient, when he wanted to bring it, when he felt prompted to bring the gift to the Lord, he brought it. The other, though, in contrast, brought it, and it was defined by a word that I purposefully omitted from the text a moment ago. And the word is first. The word is first. And it says, the one who brought first to God, God had regard for that gift. The one who brought based upon their own sense of convenience... God had no regard for that gift. Look what it says. I'll read it to you in terms of the way it's written. In the course of time, Cain brought to the Lord an offering of the fruit, whereas Abel brought of the firstborn of the flock and of their fat portions, and God had regard for that gift. Again, the principle is God wants surrender. 
so that he can restore the worst and he can redeem the best of our lives. And here is the part where we're going to get into what does it mean that we give our first and best to God? There are two tables here on this stage, and I'm going to be joined by some folks here as they bring it out, and you're very welcome to watch them as they prepare the illustration. On one side, we've got God's table. It's the Lord's table. It's what we're bringing to God. And on the other side, we've got our table. And I want you to pay attention to the tension that arises inside of you as you watch our table being established and God's table being prioritized. As we give to God, there is something transformative that occurs in our lives as we do this. As we give first unto God, we start to see the multiplication occur in our lives. So as you're watching that, let me share with you the transformative effect of giving first to God. There are three points. If you have your app open, you can fill in the blanks this weekend. If you're not aware, we have a we have an app. You can get it from the mobile app store and Google or whatever it is that your platform is. But point number one is this. Bringing our best reveals how we seek God first. When we bring our best to God, it reveals how we seek God first. Now, I'm a Colorado Avalanche fan. Any, anyone? Anyone loves the Lord like me? Okay. Um, Colorado Avalanche fan. We're going to pray for an awakening and a revival. There were not very many hands up just then. Anyway, Colorado Avalanche, if you're not familiar, the NHL team from Central Denver. Uh, they're an incredible team. Great, great, great team. I love the Colorado Avalanche. I am the guy that without any alcohol want to take my shirt off and write AVS on my chest. Like, I'm that guy. Okay. I am an all-in, full tilt to the right guy leans in at sport games. But I want to tell you right now, the ads in my life are not first. But I love it. I love it. I love going to a game. There is something about watching McKinnon and McCarr score from the blue line or watching some sort of snapshot or wrister. It's amazing. I love it. I love the fighting too. I'm sorry. I'm just saying this is not redeemed in my life yet. I love watching them throw down. I'm like, sometimes there is a fight occurring and a hockey game breaks out afterwards. It's amazing. And I love that too. Anyway, I love it because I get to engage in the moment. But I want to tell you again, the ads are not first in my life. How do I illustrate that? If I were to not give the first and best of the Lord, the first and best of my life to the Lord, I could probably sit lower in the ball arena. I could probably be lower bowl, not in the upper tier where you need a pair of binoculars to even see the player, let alone the puck that they're chasing after. Anyway, with that all being said, I could probably get a few more beers, et cetera. If I could do that, could go more often, et cetera. But the point is this, I want to give my first and best to God. Here's why, here's the principle. The avalanche. As much as I enjoy watching the puck hit the back of the net, can do nothing to restore my soul. There are moments when I cheer. There are moments when my boys and I were like in a lineup and we just go crazy together, but it cannot restore my soul. And if you were here last weekend where Richard Garnett spoke, and it was this compelling testimonial. If you missed it, you've got to go back online and get it. It's incredible testimonial where Richard Garnett said, yes, I've seen all these things in my life, but I'll tell you what gives you greatest joy is when you give to someone else. So I want to tell you right now, could I buy more tickets? Yes, but can I build more beds through my generosity to the kingdom of God in this city? Yes, I'll tell you right now. I would rather build a bed. And this isn't like, oh, Daniel, you're so great. This is not. This is the invitation for you to step into the fullness of God. I would rather build more beds for kiddos in our community than me go to more games this year. I would rather... Give in such a way as unto the Lord that you get a hot cup of coffee when you come in from a cold Colorado morning than I get to get the second or the third beer on a Wednesday night at the Avalanche game. Why? Because I want to see God do something in your life. And truly, when you bring your first and best to God, it demonstrates to the Lord, God, you're first in my life. So I want to ask you right now, if there were this criterion, this, this test, if you will, this evaluation... Is there enough evidence based upon your checkbook? Is there enough evidence based upon the rhythms, rhythms of your life to show God that actually he is first? Or is there evidence to support otherwise? The first, when you bring it, shows that we seek God first. Second, bringing our best releases us to trust God the most. As you bring your first and best to God, you are demonstrating, God, I ultimately put my trust in you to provide for my life, not my own capacity or aptitude to acquire, but your capacity to provide for my life. And Laurie and I have seen this year after year where we've trusted God to give 10% or 11% or 12% or 13% of our income away to the Lord. God, we're showing you that we trust you to be the provider for our lives. And point three, bringing our best receives God's hands 
on the rest. Quite simply, God's blessings flow in our lives and we live in accordance to the word of God. God's blessings flow in our lives and we live based upon what it is that he has instructed for us to live by in the word of God. And I want to say this, and I want to qualify this next comment. I am not what's known as a prosperity gospel guy at all. In fact, I don't like it at all. It's a half truth, meaning it's a full lie. But here's the truth. God does want you to flourish. When Jabez said, Lord, would you bless me and would you give me more land? The Lord didn't say, knock it off, Jabez. I gave you enough already. He said, okay, Jabez, I will bless you and I will enlarge your territory. Why? Because you asked. God's heart is that you would flourish. Deuteronomy 28.8. The Lord will command a blessing on you when you give and in all that you undertake, and he will bless you in the land that the Lord your God is giving to you. Proverbs 3, 9 and 10. So honor the Lord with your wealth, and your barns will be filled with plenty, and your vats will be bursting with fine Argentinian Malbec wine. It's amazing the specificity God gave to us in this regard. It's amazing. But truly, this is the heart of a good father. This is the heart of a good father. God wants to bless you. Now we kind of apply our attention to the illustration. What do you see when you look at this illustration? The first thing you probably see is abundance and small amounts. That is the heart of God for you. When you look at this table, you just see the abundance that's here. You've got all kinds of abundance. Ephesians 3.20. God can give you more than you can ask, seek, or imagine. John 10.10. The enemy comes to steal, kill, and destroy, but God came that you might have the abundant life. That is not prosperity gospel. That's gospel. I think oftentimes we think we'll get to heaven and we'll have to apologize for asking for the Lord for blessing in our lives. And I think the opposite is true. I think the Lord would say, I had so much for you. Why were you willing to settle for less? Emotionally and mentally and spiritually and physically, in all ways, God wants to bless you. And again, it's not prosperity gospel. It's the gospel. Don't get prosperity before God's presence and his provision to satisfy the curse and to forgive you, but recognize that it is for freedom that Christ has set you free. God has set you free to experience the blessing of the Lord in your life. And so with all of that, I want to I wanna share kind of three applications for this illustration. The first one is personally. The second one is biblically. And then the third one is going to be monetarily, personally speaking. This illustration is to illustrate to all of us how when we put God first, when we give God our first of every 10 salary, God, you can have all of my salary. God, when we give to you the very first of our lives, God gives us blessing and abundance. Now, I want you to think of that personally. Jesus spoke about this at the Sermon on the Mount. I overlook in the Sea of Tiberias there, the Sea of Galilee, overlook in the hillside there, it said that, He said, seek ye first the kingdom of God and all of the righteousness of God and all these things will be added unto you. Now put this in the context of the illustration. Seek first the kingdom of God and his right things. What he says in the word and all these other things will be added unto you. Now think of this as your marriage. As hard as you've tried to fix your marriage, you cannot fix your marriage until you put God first. And I know it's counterintuitive. Your spouse is saying to you, I want to spend more time with you. I want to spend more time with you. And you go, well, every time we spend time together, we fight. The more we spend time together, the more we fight. I want to tell you right now, seek ye first the kingdom of God. It's counterintuitive, but Laurie will say to me, honey, I really think you should go on a hike on the trail for an hour and spend time with Jesus. And I'm like, honey, I thought you wanted to see me. She's like, I want to see you, not the current you. And so I'll go on a hike. And I'll have an encounter with God. I'm seeking first the kingdom of God and his right things. And then I return and all of a sudden there is this incredible time where we are together. Why? Because God's heart is to give you all these things. You try and fix your marriage on your own. I want to tell you right now, you cannot fix the problems that you created. You cannot solve or retract the words that you have spoken. It's all counterintuitive. You cannot spend enough time with your spouse when you're in a bad place, but when you invest it first in God, all of a sudden you're like, things are flowing great. So personally, God wants to bless you. Well, what is the principle that causes that to occur? I'll tell you. And with that, we move into the biblical principle. In the kingdom of God, and this is going to get a little technical and a little theological, track with me. In God, the first given 
is the redemptive portion for that which remains. Now, think of it in the context of Jesus. Jesus is the firstborn son to redeem all of humanity. Why did he have to come as the firstborn son? Why couldn't he have been one of the siblings? Because the first is the redemptive portion to redeem Adam who came first. So Jesus came and laid down his life and satisfied the curse to be the redemptive portion for all of humanity. Now, in your context, the first given to God has the capacity to redeem all of that which remains. Romans 11 says it this way. If the dough offered as the first fruit is holy, the emphasis being the first fruit that given to God is holy, so is the remainder of the lump. The whole lump is holy. They're knowing this. Okay, now let's get technical. If this is the redemptive portion, God's got our pepper, he's got an apple, he's got a cutie, he's got all these other things that are funny shape that you eat if you're really healthy and so inclined. All those things. God gets all those things. When we give it first to God, it has the capacity to redeem which remains. Now let me then flip over here. That would then mean if we give God the first of every 10 salaries, God, we're going to give to you the first. He can redeem the remainder. But if we say, God, I need the first because I need to pay my mortgage, I want to tell you right now, your mortgage company has no capacity to redeem the rest. But when you first give it to God, God can redeem the remainder. You might say, no, no, no I'm going to give it not to the mortgage company. I'm going to give my first and my best to Lifetime Gym. I'm going to give them that 268, whatever it is, monthly bill that's soaring and climbing. I'm going to give it because I'm going to invest in myself. I want to tell you, there is investment in you investing in yourself at Lifetime Gym, but that first 270 that you give, not to God, but to yourself, has no capacity to restore and redeem the remainder. God has a way of redeeming the remainder. He has a way of redeeming, and it's the redemptive portion. Now then let's pivot into the third realm, monetarily. Monetarily. And by the way, I love talking about this stuff. You're like, this should be awkward for you. I'm English and I still would love to talk about sex on a Sunday and money on a weekend. I'm just saying. Why? Because it's central to our lives. We have a crisis of identity in the first realm and we have a crisis of absence in the second. So let's see what God has to say about both. Amen? Sex and money. That would be a series. We could grow this church. Go to Mountain Springs, hear about sex, get married, and get rich. It's entirely not biblical, but we'll try it anyway. Anyway, that being said, okay, the third realm is monetarily. Third realm is monetarily. It says this in Malachi 3.10. Bring the full tithe. The word tithe is a Hebrew word coming from tenth or meaning one-tenth. Meaning when you come to God, if you have ten of these, you give the first one to God. That is the principle. When you come, it says bring to God the full tithe into the storehouse that there may be food in my house. Now I want to get really technical about a word right now. The word there in Malachi 3.10 is bring. It doesn't say give to God. It says bring. Now let me illustrate that with my 210,000 mile 2004 Toyota Corolla. You're welcome. If I were to come to you and say, hey, I hear, I hear you have a need for a vehicle. I have a fine vehicle. You're welcome to use it. It's my 2004 Corolla. And you use it for a month and a half until you get your vehicle back. It's a Ford. It's broken a lot. You're welcome to use it. So you have my Toyota and you're driving it. But then a month and a half, six, seven weeks later, you come back and you go, hey, I got the keys. I want to give to you a Corolla. I'd be like, bro, you've not had it that long. It's not yours. It's mine. No, no, no. I want to give you a Corolla. It's not giving you the Corolla back to me. It's bringing my Corolla back to me. Now, don't miss this. We often think we're generous when we give God something. Generosity begins where obedience tapers off and generosity begins to soar. The first of the ten is not the finishing line of generosity. It's the starting point of obedience. And he says, bring to me. In other words, it's his Corolla. It's his and he says, bring it back to me. And he says, let me then show you what will happen with the remainder. And this is where I believe, and I'm going to explain this to you with God economy and God math here in a moment, that our 90% can go further than our 100%. Here's how. He says, put me to the test in this. 
If I will not open the windows of heaven for you and pour down for you a blessing until there is no more need, in verse 11, Malachi 3, 11, here it is, I will rebuke the devourer for you. Okay, here is the principle. When you bring first to God, he says, I will rebuke the devourer that wants to devour the remainder and I will put this protection over it. I will rebuke the devourer so that I will destroy, it will not destroy the fruits of your soil and the vine in which the field, it shall not fail to bear fruit. Here's the point. I want you to imagine right now you have a salary. Some of you are like, I'd love this to be my salary. I'm just terrible at math and even more in public. So here it is. So you have a salary of $100,000. You're like, yes, Lord, I receive that. I step into that calling right now. Some of you are like, that was 12 years ago, Lord. Don't take me back there. I can't live on that anymore. Here's the point. $100,000. Only because my math is terrible, but I can work out 10% of 100. Here it is. So you have $100,000, and you go, I can barely live on my $100,000 a year. I want to tell you, this doesn't work for those of you who are a math major, but for those of you who have a major walk with God, you get this. God can cause your 90, which remains, with the blessing of God through giving your first and best, He causes your 90 to go further than your 100. Why? Because of this verse that he will rebuke the devourer. What does that mean? There is a promise here. May you say your salary is 50,000. You give your 10% to God. Your salary is 44. You give your 10% to God. It's easier when your salary is smaller. You're like, I receive a 20,000 salary now. I can give two grand a year. Whatever it is that God has entrusted to you, I'm telling you there is this direct correlation with the abundance that comes into your life when you give first to God. And some of you are like, oh, wait, I know scripture. I know scripture and I know that a lot of what you're quoting right now is Old Testament and we're under grace now. So let's go there for a moment, shall we? Okay, Jesus never in the scripture, in the New Testament, relinquishes ground that God has gained in terms of spiritual formation and morality, it is always a higher standard. So a lot of what we're speaking about right now is give God your first and best. Give him one of every 10. You have 10, give him the first. You go, oh, that's law. We're under grace. Okay, let's take then grace. Jesus, Sermon on the Mount. Jesus, Sermon on the Mount, the greatest sermon series ever presented there. He then says, okay, let's take adultery. That's a fun one for a Sunday. Let's take adultery. He says in the Old Testament, you have heard it said you should not commit, you shall not commit adultery. You're like, I agree with that. But then Jesus says, but I say to you, I say to you, if you have looked at a woman with lust in your eye, you have committed adultery with her in your heart. And you're like, I think I like the Old Testament more. Here's the point. He always ratchets it up. Why? Because he cares about our transformation. If you've said yes to Jesus, that is not the finishing line of your formation. It is the starting point of your maturation. And the same way when you give your first and best, it is the beginning. And I'll tell you, you go, okay, I get it, I get it, I get it. Let me say one more thing about that. The enemy would do everything he can do in your life to prevent you from really stepping into what God's best is for you, whatever that might be. In your marriage, he causes you to be tempted looking at others. In your parenting, he causes you to compare your parenting with others so you feel down about yourself. The enemy does everything. The enemy doesn't want you to get this. The enemy doesn't want you to understand this. Why? Because you become unstoppable in the kingdom of God when you, when you live based upon what it is that God wants for your life. So I want to say this. Learn all that you can about this. Learn all that you can about faith. Learn all that you can about prayer. Learn all that you can about the first and ten giving to God. Why? Because I want that for you. God wants that for you. And you go, I don't know if I can give that because if I give that, I don't have enough. I want to tell you right now, you have more than enough. And God rebukes the devourer, the one who comes to steal. But here's what we do. We even go one step further if we're not careful. We almost hide this away from the Lord. God, I don't want you to see what I got. But I'm hungry. And then you step over and you go, hey, I, I actually could do with a banana. A banana. Paraphrase. <laughs> and what you do is you don't take it from yours. You take it from His. And I want to tell you right now, you want to see your life transformed this year? 
Stop eating off the table of which is not yours. Prepare the table that is the Lord's, for he has prepared for you a table in the presence of your enemies. You can pull up a chair at this table and you can live based upon that which remains. Give your life to God. Surrender everything that you have to him. It's radical, yes. Give your first and best of your week. Give your first and best of your affection. Give your first and best of your resource. Because God wants to do an incredible transformative work through you. Proverbs 11, 24, 25. The world of the generous gets larger and larger. The world of the stingy gets smaller and smaller. The one who blesses others is abundantly blessed. Those who help others are helped. Like last week, I don't want you sitting here this weekend thinking about what it is that everyone else should do. What it is that he should do, she should do, they should do. But what is it that you should do? To trust God. And to give of God first and best that you would step into the realm of blessing. God wants to bless you. If you're not in a place of blessing right now, could it be that this is part of the reason why? You go, no, I think it's that I'm a jerk. Well, that may be true too, if you're marriage. But let me tell you, you'll be less of a jerk when there's more of Jesus in you. You have all of the Holy Spirit as a believer, but all too often as a believer, you don't let the Holy Spirit have all of you. Give your life to Him and make this the best year ever. Let's pray. Father, right now we come to you with arms open wide, hands open wide. God, we recognize that in open hands you can take, but in open hands we are in the place to receive. It's more blessed to give than to receive. So Jesus, right now we give. Even aware of the blessing of what it is to welcome more of your presence in our lives. Stir us even now, Holy Spirit, about what we can do. How we can live. How we can trust that you multiply that which remains when you're the recipient of that given first. We honor you, Jesus. Amen. What a great challenge from Pastor Daniel. Let's individually and as a church rise to this challenge of being generous. And if you have any questions on what that may look like in your life, feel free to reach out to us here at the church. Join us next week as we continue in our generosity series. Have a fantastic week.